By now, you might have figured out that this fun activity is not really one, but two fun activities. One, making the microscope itself, and two, using it to look into onions. Choose a good glass bead and mount it on a piece of cardboard, and now you can discover how things that are too small for our eye to see actually look. But wait, don't you want to know why or how these glass beads make small things look big? Have you seen a lens or a microscope? If you have, aren't the glass lenses bigger? And about the onions, what are you able to observe through the lens? Why do we add water to the peel? And why do we need a stainer, safranin or iodine? To understand the importance of the role of safranin, repeat this activity without adding any safranin solution. Why do you think this is happening? If you don't have safranin, what else can you use? How about turmeric solution? How about pen ink? What about iodine solution? To understand the relevance of water, repeat this fun activity without adding any water. What is your observation now? Also try and observe all kinds of other objects and see if you can see something fascinating in them. Like onion peel, garlic peel is similar and a good alternative. What about other vegetable peels? Try and make whatever you view as thin as possible. What about a layer of oil that forms on water? Or as thin a layer of paper as possible? Try and observe a human hair or a bird feather or even a dead ant or mosquito. You are bound to be amazed by the fine details you can see through your simple microscope. Try placing the microscope very close to your mobile phone camera and see if you can get a clear magnified image on your phone. You can take pictures and videos and share these with your friends. It'll be very useful to keep a small notebook where you draw what you see through the microscope. This will be a good reference for you in the future to compare various things that you have seen through the microscope. It'll also be useful to compare the same object as seen through different microscopes. For example, with a larger bead, a 5mm bead, or even a smaller bead, say a 1mm bead, or other microscopes in your school or that may be available in the market. The image quality and magnification will vary from microscope to microscope and comparing these will give you a better understanding of the phenomenon of magnification and the related optics therein, as well as comparing the different views of the same specimen or different specimens. The microscope has a long and colourful history and is a fascinating creation of human endeavour. It has been known for over 2000 years that glass bends light. Romans noticed that seeing through glass often makes the thing on the other side look larger. People started playing with different shapes of glass and made the first lenses. Around the same time, the Romans also noticed that a globe of water, that is water kept in a transparent ball-shaped jug, was also magnifying objects kept on the other side. However, it was only more than a thousand years later that people actually started making lenses on a commercial scale, mainly for spectacles. Italian Salvino da Armate in the 13th century is credited with making the first eyeglass. And a few decades earlier, English Franciscan monk Roger Bacon was the first to combine lenses. His work and research was heavily inspired by the Arab scientists of the 10th century, for example, Ibn al Haytham and Ibn Sal, whose books and discoveries are pioneering works that paved the way to modern optics. However, it was only in the 16th century that we have the first evidence of a compound microscope made by the Dutch spectacle makers Hans and his son Zacharias Janssen. They made draw tubes with a series of lenses, biconvex and planoconvex lenses, and an eyepiece, considered a pioneering design at the time. The microscope achieved a magnification of 3x to 10x. It was another Dutch scientist, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who is the first known maker and user of the compound microscope in the late 17th century.
The quality of his lens manufacturing was the best at the time, and while others were struggling with a maximum magnification of 50x, he achieved almost 300x magnification by being able to position many more lenses in a tube without losing image quality. Because of this, he was able to make many pioneering biological discoveries and describe in detail things like bacteria, yeast plants, teeming life in a drop of water, and the circulation of blood corpuscles in capillaries. Robert Hooke, another great English scientist, then used van Leeuwenhoek's work and design to do his own pioneering work in microscopy, immortalized in his incredible book, Micrographia. Showing remarkable handmade drawings by Hooke himself of all kinds of biological specimens, especially insects. It is no wonder that it is Hooke who first coined the term cell to describe the pores he saw through his microscope. And it is only with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century that German engineer Zeiss and his protege Abbe made the first modern microscopes as we know them today. Higher precision grinding and polishing has taken lenses to their limit of optical magnification, that is seeing features as small as 200 nanometers. Thanks to the wavelength of visible light, it is not possible to see things of smaller size using optical microscopes, and hence the advent of the electron microscope in this day and age. Coming back to a rather more rudimentary simple glass bead microscope, here is a question. Have you ever tried touching and feeling the lens of your grandparents' spectacles? Do you find that it is thicker in the center and thinner towards the edges? Such lenses are called convex lenses. These convex lenses help us to see small things bigger. The extent to which the lens makes the object look bigger is called magnification. If you have observed, those who have more difficulty in seeing wear thicker glasses. Between a football and a tennis ball, which one's surface is more curved? A tennis ball, right? If you think about it, as the radius of a circle becomes smaller and smaller, the circle becomes more and more curved. Now, the bead that you used in your fun activity is a very small glass ball. Since it is small, it is much more curved. It so happens that the extent to which a lens magnifies increases if the curvature of the lens is high. As a result, a small bead magnifies the object much more than a bigger bead. In summary, to see a small object big, we need a convex lens. The thickness of the lens, curvature of the lens, and the distance between the object and the lens all determine the magnification of the lens. Some scientific terms. A convex lens is a lens that is thinner at the edge and thicker in the middle. The radius of curvature is a measure that allows us to understand how curved any particular shape for a curve, it equals a radius of the circular arc, which best approximates the curve at that point. Magnification is the process of making the image look bigger than the object. This enlargement is quantified by a calculated number, also called magnification. Some theory prerequisites. You should have a basic idea of the terms like lens, microscope, light, focus, image, reflection, etc. A basic idea about ray diagrams. Some basic knowledge about the parts of a plant, like roots, leaves, stem, and their function. And simple motor skills, like using a pair of scissors safely, handling adhesive tapes, etc. Some theory concepts behind simple microscopy. The theoretical concept behind a simple microscope can be explained with the help of the following ray diagram. Consider a biconvex lens with its optical center C and focus F and F prime. This is part of a microscope. When a small object AB is placed next to it at a distance closer to its focal length, that is between C and F prime, a ray of light that originates from the point A parallel to the principal axis passes through the lens and gets refracted along the line OX. Another ray of light originating from the point A passing through C follows the line CY. Since the two rays OX and CY are diverging, they can be drawn backwards until they meet at the point A prime. The magnified image of the object AB is produced at A prime B prime. 
As can be seen in the diagram, the image of the object is highly magnified and erect. One point to remember is that the eye is assumed to be placed very close to the lens so that the distance of distinct vision may be calculated from the lens itself. Here the image A prime B prime is formed at the distance of distinct vision D. Onion peels are very good examples to study cells and their arrangements. This is because onion cells are large, so we can easily observe them through a simple microscope. It is also very easy to feel the thickness of the cell. The thickness of the peel that you hold in your hand is the thickness of a single cell. Essentially, the peel is a single layer lattice of onion cells. Through the unique microscope that you constructed, you might have observed a nice and clear pattern of long rectangle-shaped cells arranged in a proper pattern. Each rectangle is a cell. A cell wall runs around the cell and gives a rectangular shape of the cell. You might have also noticed dark spots that appear like dirt within each rectangle. These spots are nuclei. Vacuoles which remove waste from cells and retain water can also be seen. In short, they would appear something like the one given in the picture below. Cells of different organisms can be of very different sizes. So one may have to choose the microscope they want to use depending on the cell that is being observed. For example, onion peels are so large that if they are magnified by 50 times, their size, using the microscope you have designed, is very clearly visible. But to study the cells in our cheek, we must magnify them a thousand times. Human ovum and the egg that we eat are so large that it can be seen with the naked eye. The simple microscope is a very interesting device. Although you made a very simple model of a simple microscope, there are some slightly more advanced models that work on the same principle that you just learned. A simple microscope can be used for a variety of things, some of which are mentioned below. A simple microscope is a great tool for studying the venation of leaves, flower petals, etc. Magnification by a simple microscope will make it easy for you to understand the differences in structure of various leaves, petals and vegetable peels. A magnifying glass is also a kind of simple microscope and is used for enlarging the print of a book, texture of a cloth, etc. You can use a simple microscope for magnifying fingerprints. A simple microscope is used by jewelers to examine the details of jewelry and stones and simple microscopes are often used by watchmakers to visualize and handle very small parts that are assembled in a watch. Simple microscopes are of great interest to biologists and geologists because they use them to see magnified structures of leaves, rocks, soil, etc. and use these details for their research. We hope that you have had fun while assembling and using your very own simple microscope. Now that you know the principle behind how a simple microscope works and how useful a simple microscope is, we encourage you to use it for more objects around you. Just like you learned how to look for onion cells and even the organelles within, you can continue your explorative journey to look at things in even finer detail. Have fun. Goodbye.